Hello and welcome back to episode 9 of charlie.inspired. Okay, first off, the elephant in the room. I have relocated. That makes it sound far more exciting than it actually is. I've just moved from my bedroom to my office. But let me break it down for you real quick as to why I've done this and why I'm telling you about this. I really, 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 really want to create more content for YouTube and build this channel. Um, So I bit the bullet. Um, I've spent some savings on a new microphone and a new camera and I've decided to go all in. So please don't fail me now. (laughs) I really need you guys to help me make this happen. This means I'm going to try, try being the opposite word, um, to post more content. I'm thinking like music video reactions, tattoo content, general reactions to stuff on the internet, maybe a good am I the arsehole post, um, because I love those. But the real reason as to why I want to post more content alongside my true crime, I don't want to stop that because I'm very different when I'm talking about a case that's happened and someone's life that's been taken away or drastically destroyed to when I'm actually just general in life or reacting to things. Obviously, you have to handle true crime with some compassion and respect and you have to really kind of do it in a sensitive way that's going to honour the victim and the families involved. So I am a lot more toned down in my true crime podcast and that's fine. That should be the case. But I want to let my personality shine through. I want you guys to get to know me better. So I'm going to be posting different types of content on my page. If that's for you, that is fantastic. Please welcome, enjoy the content that I'm going to be posting. I don't know how regularly I'm going to be posting it or what days. Currently, my true crime podcast comes out every Friday at 1 p.m. and I'm going to continue with that. But there will be other content on my page. So please check it out if it's already on there, which it probably will be by the time this comes out. So if you are listening on Spotify and you want to see that type of content, head on over to my YouTube channel, charlie.inspired. Hit subscribe subscribe and let the fun begin. This week we are going to delve deep into a very very recent story, a story that highlights the danger that the LGBTQ plus community is still in today. But before we jump into that I have to say my usual disclaimer. I do not mean any harm nor disrespect to the victims or families involved in today's case. These episodes are researched by myself and myself only with the information that's already available online. I do like to put my opinions into my episodes so please bear that in mind you do not have to agree with them but as you are entitled to yours I'm also entitled to mine. Lastly, this case contains violent details of abuse, rape, torture, murder, Um, so if you're not in the headspace for that, that is fine. Pause now and take a break and come back to it when you are feeling in the right headspace to do so. With all that being said, let's take a breath in and out. Okay, let's begin. Today, we are going to uncover a story of when two teenagers plan to murder and their plans just so happen to be the very thing that lead to their conviction. But we're going to start by focusing on our victim in today's case, 16-year-old Brianna Jai. Brianna was born on the 7th of November 2006 to her mother, Esther Jai, and Peter Spooner. They were a loving, close-knit family that lived in the district of Culture, Warrington in England. Brianna was assigned male at birth and at around the age of 14, two years prior to this case, she came out as trans to her family. Her family loved and supported her as best as they could. Brianna was described as a bit of an oxymoron in a really soft, gentle way by her mother. Online, she appeared really confident. She was really sure of herself and outgoing, whereas offline, she suffered from a lot of anxiety, which affected her in and out of school. Brianna had actually built like a little safe space online. On TikTok, she had over 31,000 followers, which for a 16 year old is a lot of followers. She would post dancing videos, her miming to songs, putting makeup on and so on, just content of her, her life, her being a teenager. And people loved her people loved her content and I really related to Brianna at this point when I was researching this case because I too can come across online as someone who's really really confident uh, when in actual fact I don't really leave the house um events and crowded spaces have always scared me um it just causes my anxiety to skyrocket which as a musician that can be a lot (laughs) so just remember to take that the people that you see online whether they're influencers or not they are people at the end of the day Throughout Brianna's life at Birchwood Community High School, there's a differing report of bullying that she faced as a result of transphobia. Brianna's friends say that she would often fall victim to bullying at the school, but the school would later deny any reports of bullying involving Brianna. Just because the school wasn't aware of it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Realistically, it probably did happen. 
As a teenager, Brianna was diagnosed with ADHD and autism, which accelerated her anxiety. This was affecting Brianna's schoolwork, so as a result, the school supported her by having a personalised timetable different to the other students in her year. Instead of sitting in a classroom with the rest of her students, she would often sit in the inclusion unit where she had one-on-one teaching. That's not unusual at all. I had this from time to time throughout my school life when my anxiety was too bad to sit in a classroom, um, and it did help helped me get through the day, helped me get through a specific lesson, you know, but then I was one of those kids that would latch onto their mum um, and scream for them not to leave. Um, so yeah, that's probably says a lot about me. A lot of schools do this for students who require a bit of TLC or even students that don't like necessarily behave well um, within a group setting. Uh, sometimes it was even used as a punishment for some kids to be in exclusion for a week, um, but for some students it actually really helped them focus and learn. But this inclusion room is exactly where Brianna would meet the very person who planned her murder, but we'll get onto that later. Now it's really hard to discuss this story without immediately giving away what happens, and this was so recent that it's probably going to be at the forefront of your mind anyways, so forgive me for lacking on the suspense in this episode. But at this point in the case, it's time to look into our suspects. Initially, when they were convicted earlier this year in 2024, yeah, it was this recently, they were anonymous to the public, and they were referred to as Girl X and Boy Y. This was to protect their identity as, well, their children. But once they were convicted this year, the judge declared their names were to be made public. And to be honest, waiting two years until they're 18 isn't going to make much of a difference because they're going to be in prison either way. So I think it was the right call. And for the sake of ease throughout this case, we're going to refer to them via their names. So we're going to start with Girl X, who is later revealed to be Scarlett Jenkinson. Scarlett had a stable upbringing and lived with her parents and her three older brothers. Her mum was a teacher and her dad a builder. A noble career for them both. All reports of Scarlett following this case say there was absolutely nothing to indicate that she had any trauma in her life that would push her to turn into a dark, violent person. She lived a happy childhood surrounded by support and love in her family home, but she didn't have many friends in school. In fact, our second suspect later told police that Scarlett didn't like many people and that they didn't really like her back either. And seemingly everyone around her just couldn't believe that she was responsible for this case. As Scarlett entered teenagehood, she began her obsession with horror films and would often watch them by herself alone in her room. A lot of psychiatrists in this case would point out that this could be an indication to what she goes on to do, but I don't know. I think it's pretty normal for teenagers to become obsessed with horror films. I remember being like 11, 12, 13 and starting to show an interest in them. We would watch them at sleepovers and like beg our mums to hire that 15 film at Blockbusters. Good times. I miss Blockbusters. That was a good day out. But kids nowadays only need to log into Netflix, which they probably already have on their phones, tablets, TVs in their rooms. And they just need to say, yeah, I'm 18, click a tick box, enter a date of birth at most and then they can access whatever they want. And that's probably quite important to differentiate at this point that yes, my generation used to watch horror films and just because you watch fictional horror doesn't mean you want to reenact this in real life. However, Scarlett had access to this content at her fingertips whenever she wanted. So I can imagine for some children, they become a bit desensitized to it if they're consuming it all the time. Does that mean that children who watch a lot of this content will become murderers? No, but it's an important factor to bring into this that probably she was consuming it a lot. In fact, Scarlett not only loved fictional horror, but she started to become obsessed with serial killers, in particular Jeffrey Dahmer, Richard Ramirez, and Harold Shipman, as their names were all scribbled down in her notebooks. Listen, some people become a bit obsessed with serial killers and think, you know, I don't know, there's a there's a thing, isn't there, that people just become a bit obsessed with them? And probably this was around a similar time that the Jeffrey Dahmer Netflix show came out. At the age of 11, when Scarlett started at Culcheth High School, she started self-harming as a result of the anxiety that she was feeling. Secondary school is a big adjustment for children, and unfortunately it's becoming all too common that children start self-harming as a way to cope with these new, big and scary feelings that they're experiencing for the first time. It seems like Scarlett didn't have that many friends in school either, from what I can see. But not long after she did start at this school, she made a friend who she shared pretty much all of her thoughts with, which brings us on to our second suspect. Eddie Ratcliffe. Eddie was the middle child to his younger sister and older brother, and they lived with their parents. His mum was a graphic designer and his dad runs a kickboxing gym. Eddie was described as quiet and shy by his teachers, but very intelligent. In 2022, Scarlett was excluded from Culture's High School after she was caught handing cannabis edibles or gummies, as they are known on the streets with the kids. She was caught handing these to other students. Whilst these students didn't suffer any long-term effects, they did become ill following this and seemingly weren't aware of what they were consuming at the time, which is so dangerous because if you're a kid and someone hands you a gummy sweet, 
you are not going to know the difference. Like they literally just taste like sugar and the effects take a while to kick in. So you can literally consume twice, three times the amount that an adult is supposed to without even realising. As a result of this incident, Scarlett obviously had to move schools where she was moved to Birchwood Community High School and she spent a lot of her time in the inclusion unit away from other children. Or as my school used to call it, Room 101, which is pretty dark now that I look back on it. This inclusion room is exactly where Brianna and Scarlett first met and initially they bonded. Apparently they formed a bond over makeup after Brianna complimented Scarlett on her look. The girls would often talk at their time in the inclusion room and Brianna thought that she'd made a new friend. For YouTube viewers, Miso has entered the chat. Um, you got any words to say, Miso? No. Are you going to behave? Do you need, do you need a time out? You, you going to get down? Okay, he's gone. So... Because of this move, Scarlett and Eddie were now no longer at the same school, but they did stay in touch most days via WhatsApp and Snapchat. On the 5th of December, a message exchange between the two revealed a lot to us about those pair's interests. Scarlett sent Eddie a link to a dark web website where you could watch videos of people being raped, tortured and murdered. Along with this link to the dark web was a message saying, I love watching torture vids, real ones from the dark web. I've liked this stuff for a while. I finally found a good red room. Now, prior to this case, I didn't actually know what a red room was or that it even existed, but that's probably to my naivety. I wish I still didn't know, to be perfectly honest. Um, so let me burst that bubble for you too, because if I have to know it, you have to know it. A red room is a place where people can watch live videos of victims being raped, tortured and murdered and pretty much anything you can think of. Scarlett would often frequent these sites and she actually had a specific browser installed on her phone that would allow her to access the dark web whenever she wanted. These sites aren't something that you stumble across. You have to go looking for them and you have to use fake IP addresses to protect your identity. And I don't think most 15 year olds or 16 year olds would know how to do this unless they specifically put time into finding out how to do so. It's not like she was scrolling on Facebook and then suddenly found a link for it. She would have had to actually go searching for this. Don't get me wrong, once you go searching, it's not hard to find the dark web. I've seen it myself. It's not a pleasant place and I never wish to witness it again. Um, but it's a scary thought that children can access this. This message exchange is a clear shift for Scarlett because she's now no longer seeking joy from fictional horror but it's actually escalated to real life pain and crime and violence. And we have to remember that she is a child whilst consuming this. This type of content would traumatise most adults if they were to stumble across it. Take me for example, I love horror films and I can watch them on my own and even enjoy them, laugh at them, because they're fictional. True crime content, again, I regularly consume on my own because I have a fascination on human psychology and crime. However, it's not the same type of enjoyment as a horror because it's real lives that are destroyed. But the minute I come across a video of someone even accidentally hurting themselves, like breaking a leg, I feel sick. Like, I remember seeing a video of someone breaking their leg on the MTV video Scarred. Does anyone else remember that? <laughs> That stuff shouldn't have been on the TV. And it still makes me feel ill when I think about it. I'm not even a squeamish person. Like I'm pretty good with blood, pretty good with broken bones, whatever. I just, I just don't want to see it. I just like, if I want to see it, I will go out of my way to see it. But if I'm like just watching something and it appears and I'm not prepared for it. Yeah, I'm not, not about that. In December, 2022, Scarlett sends Eddie a text saying, I'm obsessed over someone I know, but I don't have feelings for them. She's called Brianna. I don't know how to explain. Also, she has a dick lol. Eddie replied, is it a femboy or a tranny? And tell me what you feel when you interact with it. Scarlett says, I got nervous and stuff, but my heart felt normal. Eddie replied, I don't think you're necessarily in love, but I think you're more curious and intrigued by its unnatural nature. Okay, we can clearly see from this interaction, there are two very different reactions here to Brianna. Scarlett seems intrigued, a little infatuated or curious almost, but it doesn't initially feel like a negative reaction, right? Whereas Eddie keeps referring to her as it. From the off, he completely dehumanises Brianna. So it won't come as a surprise that there is a transphobic element in this case, but we'll go more onto that later in terms of motive. In January 2023, Scarlett and Eddie make a kill list. This kill list contains five names of people that they know and they would like to murder. All of the names on this list were children at their retrospective schools, but the fifth name on this list was actually Brianna Jai. In January, they actually planned to murder a boy who was also on this list, where Scarlett and Eddie exchanged messages planning on how they were going to carry this out. Scarlett initiated by saying, You distract. I go from behind with my knife, then stab his neck, slit his throat and stab him in the back. Eddie replied, Could I stab him? 
Scarlet says, Sure, I know a hidden spot nobody goes to in Linear Park. Eddie said, I thought he was your friend, but you seem pretty okay with me killing him. Scarlet says, He is my friend, but to be honest, I don't care if you kill him. I can do my best to help you too. Just ask me to do it and I will do it. Eddie replied, I'm going to let you decide what to do with him. If you kill him, I would like you to do as you see fit. Cut out his heart, cook it and feed it to your dog. Scarlet and Eddie made their plan for this boy. And Scarlet even created a fake Instagram account to befriend him in hopes that they could lure him to the park to carry out their attack. Luckily, this boy didn't believe the fake account and actually ended up blocking them on social media. But not long after this, the pair turned their attention to Brianna. And in January 2023, just four months after the Gummies incident at Scarlett's last school, there was even evidence to suggest that Scarlett tried to poison Brianna with ibuprofen tablets. Brianna's mum, Esther, recalled coming home to find Brianna being sick in the bathroom, writhing around in agony, clutching at her stomach, saying she felt like she was going to die. And on the 23rd of January, Scarlett texts Eddie to say... You know that girl I mentioned, Brianna? I'm still trying to kill her, and the easiest way is pill overdose. Later that day, she texted, Brianna is still ill. Those tablets I gave her might slowly be killing her. There isn't much information on exactly how Scarlett managed to give Brianna these pills, or how many pills she actually managed to give her in the end. But the fact that she was writhing around in agony on the bathroom floor suggests that it exceeded the advised two pills for pain relief. We also can see from this interaction that actually it's Scarlett who initiates wanting to kill Brianna, and that actually she even tries to do this by herself. So we know that by December 2022, Scarlett is growing a fascination with Brianna, and in early January, Brianna is added to their kill list, which of course escalates to Scarlett attempting to harm or murder Brianna via this overdose. But without success, Scarlett's desire to kill Brianna was only growing. With this, Eddie and Scarlett start making a new plan. On the 27th of January, the pair had a plan to lure Brianna to Linear Park. Scarlett messaged Brianna to come hang out with her and Eddie the next day, to which Brianna agreed. Scarlett then texted Eddie to say, She's agreed to come to Colchester tomorrow. Eddie replied, So I bring my knife? Scarlett says, Yes. It's definitely sharp enough, by the way. Meet me at the wooden post in Linear at 12. We'll go over the plan again, and I'll show you where I'm killing her. Then we'll both walk to the library to meet her. Grab onto Brianna, then slit her throat. When she starts to fall, stab her in the back, then pass me the knife. I want to stab her at least once, even if she's dead, just because it's fun. Lol. There's a lot to break down there. Initially, Scarlett says, I'll show you where I'm killing her, but then in the same breath she writes, you stab her, then pass me the knife, because I want to stab her at least once. I mean, the whole thing is odd, really, and I don't think we'll understand what was going through their heads at this time. But what we can tell is that there is a real sadistic nature here, and that they're very serious on carrying this plan out. Eddie suggested the idea of code words, where he said, let's have two words, one for get the knife ready and another to stab. Scarlet replied, for get knife ready, I'll look at you and cough. To stab, I'll say gay. Seems like an interesting code word to use there, Scarlet. Careful, your transphobia is slipping out in that message. But finally, Eddie fantasised by saying, I want to see if it will scream like a man or a girl. Again, he's just removing any sense of humanity from Brianna, and it's really important to remember these lines that Eddie says, because it does play a part in a motive. However, their plan for the 27th of January came crumbling down as Brianna texts Scarlett to say that she couldn't come anymore as she had a family dinner. We can only imagine the frustration that Scarlett felt at this time. She'd already tried once, and now had even come up with a plan, only for Brianna to unknowingly take that out of her hands. Within days of this plan falling through, Scarlett was already messaging Eddie to try and set a new date. She texted him saying, Let's kill Brianna tomorrow, 6pm. Eddie said, If I can, then yes. Scarlett replied, Please come out tomorrow between 6 and 8. Eddie said, It's a school day. I'll be eating around 7. Scarlett said, Please. I want it done ASAP. Eddie said, Can't. It's a school night. Scarlett replied, I don't want to wait. I want her to die really badly. I just want to see pure horror on her face and hear her scream in pain. The fact that in this interaction, Eddie is more concerned with getting an early night or doing homework. Um, does it show naivety or does he just not grasp the severity of what they're actually discussing here? Because quite clearly, if you were to carry out a plan like this, I don't think school's going to be chasing you for the homework that's due on Monday. In fact, you probably won't even finish school, or if you do, it will probably be behind bars. But again, we'll go more onto this later as to why we think Eddie reacts in this way. 
Days after of this interaction of Scarlett practically begging Eddie to come out and help her murder Brianna, Scarlett sent Eddie a photo of a handwritten plan of how they were going to kill Brianna this time. And at the top of this handwritten page was a date saying Saturday the 11th of February. Next to the title was Victim, Brianna Jai. The plan said, meet Eddie at Wooden Post at 1pm and walk down to library bus stop. Wait until Brianna gets off bus. Three of us walk to Linear Park. Go to pipe tunnel area. I say code word to Eddie. He stabs her in the back and I stab her in the stomach. Eddie drags the body into the area. We cover up the area with logs, etc. The way this was written out with a date and a victim as a title, it almost presents like a news article stating the facts or like a police report. It's such a juxtaposition to the childlike writing that it presents in. And on the 9th of Feb, just two days before their planned attack, Scarlett messaged Eddie to say, I'm excited about Saturday. Eddie replied, why? Scarlett said, Brianna, remember? Eddie said, oh yeah. Scarlett asked, are you excited? Eddie said, I forgot. Scarlett replied, how? Eddie said, because I'm eating. This interaction is extremely bizarre for multiple reasons, but it does show us that Scarlett's motivation, drive and hunger to kill Brianna is only becoming bigger. It's exciting her. She's actually getting thrill from the thought of it. Yet in the same breath, it shows us Eddie's ability to almost completely detach. And again, we'll touch more on that later because it does come up during the trial. So on Friday the 10th of February, Scarlett sets out the trap for Brianna. She sends Brianna a message inviting her to the park the next day, which of course Brianna agreed to. When Scarlett told Eddie that the plan was on, Eddie said he'd bring his hunting knife that his dad bought him whilst on a ski trip earlier that year. Scarlett replied, and that will definitely 100% kill her. Eddie said, yes, it cuts my skin easily. Scarlett said, I'm excited as fuck for tomorrow. And as much as I do think that Scarlett is quite a leading drive in this case, Eddie isn't shut off to the idea. He offers to bring a weapon and he seemingly has done some prep to make sure that the weapon will do the trick. But yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself again. We'll go on to that later. Saturday the 11th of February rolls around and Brianna is seen on her door camera locking up as she's leaving. She sends her mum a text on her way out to say, going to meet Scarlett, dogs are all locked up. Brianna walks to the nearest bus stop and gets on the number 28 bus into town. While she was on the bus, she actually texted her mum to say that she felt really scared to be on the bus by herself. And it's so sad to think that this was probably a really big thing for Brianna to go out by herself in town to meet a friend. And she probably sought comfort in the fact that she was finally making some friendships and spending some time outside by herself. That's a big confidence thing for someone with anxiety to do. At 12.43pm, Eddie was dropped off outside Sainsbury's and Scarlett walked up to meet him. Brianna walked off the bus as Scarlett walked up to meet her. Eddie stood back a bit. The three of them then walk the 15 minute journey towards Linear Park, popping into shops as they go. CCTV follows the three walking towards the park until they go out of sight when they arrive at Linear Park. This park, that earlier Scarlett claimed she knew a private spot where nobody goes, wasn't so private after all. It was a Saturday afternoon and a ton of people were out walking their dogs, including Mr and Mrs Vice, a couple that are walking their dog in the park that day. As the couple were on their Saturday afternoon walk, they noticed someone on the ground with a young male crouching down next to them and a young female stood nearby. But as they got closer, it became obvious as to the horrors that they've just stumbled across. Eddie and Scarlett run away from the couple through a field. Scarlett stops to turn to the couple and just stares at them as they panic over Brianna's bleeding body. Scarlett and Eddie run away and dropped Brianna's phone down a drain. Eddie got on the bus home while Scarlett walked. Panicked as to what they've just witnessed, Mrs Vice rings the police immediately and tells them everything she can. She says a young girl is laying on the ground in an unnatural, contorted position. She's covered in so much blood, I can't see her face. Police attended within minutes, and at 3.25pm, PC Andrew Chadwick tried giving Brianna CPR until the paramedics arrived. Paramedics attempted resuscitating Brianna for a further 40 minutes, but at 4.02pm, Brianna was pronounced dead. We can't begin to imagine the scene that Mr and Mrs Vice came across and the trauma that they must have following this event. The fact that they witnessed Scarlett and Eddie fleeing the scene is so vital because yes, it's a busy park, but of course there is no CCTV here, so we heavily rely on the witness statements in this case. Brianna's body was then taken for a post-mortem which revealed 28 separate stab wounds across her neck, chest, back and head. Some of these stab wounds were going as deep as 5 inches. The pathologist also revealed that up to 12 of these stab wounds were done from behind, leaving Brianna completely defenceless. As soon as Scarlett and Eddie returned home from their attack, they immediately hopped online, where they started messaging each other in what we can guess or only describe as an attempt to cover their tracks. Scarlett messaged Eddie to say, My brother just told me not to go to Linear Park because a woman got stabbed. Eddie replied, Jesus, really? Holy crap. And to push this narrative further, Scarlett then messaged Brianna's phone, 
She said, girl, is everything okay? Some teenage girl got killed in the near park. It's on the news everywhere. And why did you ditch us for some random man from Manchester? Like, what the fuck? That's so fucked up. This interaction right here, I need you to remember, because this doesn't make any sense to me. They've spent weeks exchanging messages with one another, planning on precisely how they're going to murder Brianna, even down to the date and time. So do they think that police are going to see this specific exchange and be like, oh well, ignore all the other evidence? Clearly it wasn't them. I don't know guys, maybe it's a sign of childhood naivety that they don't think they're going to get caught or they don't think that everything is going to be looked into if they do. But it just seems odd that Scarlett goes to this level of trying to cover their tracks when actually she's done nothing else to try and cover their tracks. And to make Scarlett's cover up even more sour on the tongue, she posted a tribute to Brianna online that said, Brianna was one of the best people I have ever met and such an amazing friend. It's so fucking sickening what got done to her. That same evening, Scarlett went on to message Eddie to say, do you have anxiety about getting caught? Eddie replied, probably. Scarlett replied, you're not going to get caught. Don't worry, police are shit here. And again, we see Eddie kind of really detached. His answer of probably infers that he knows he should be scared, but he's not really feeling anything right now. But actually, the police weren't shit in Cheshire in this case. In fact, they'd already recovered CCTV of the three, Brianna, Scarlett and Eddie walking towards the park. 24 hours after Brianna's murder, Scarlett received a message of someone she knew saying that she'd been spotted in the park that day with Brianna. Probably panicking that her secret place in the park had turned out to not be so secret, she panics and comes up with a story. Scarlett then goes to her mum and tells her that she had met Brianna in the park that day with Eddie, but Brianna left them to go meet a 17-year-old boy from Manchester. Obviously understanding the gravity of the situation, Scarlett's mum rings Cheshire Police. And as Scarlett's mum is talking to the contact centre officer, she decides to hand the phone over to Scarlett so she can accurately recount the story to the police. And this is where Scarlett said, We went to Linear, sat on the bench for a bit. She looked at her phone and she said she needed to go meet some boy. He was 17 from Manchester. I didn't know his name or anything. She said he was picking her up and stormed off. She said, Stop interrogating me and walked away. She's not mentioned him before. I think it's someone she met from online. We stayed in the park for a bit, then I went home and Eddie went back on the bus. And Scarlett starts scrambling. She messages Eddie to tell him to match her story, telling him that her mum had already contacted the police. She said, My mum phoned the police, so I'm not sure what's going to happen. Make sure the story adds up. Say to police everything. We met Brianna at 1.30. Walked to Linear. Sat and chilled on the bench. Brianna then looked at her phone and said she was going to meet some lad and walked off. We went Sainsbury's and chilled at the Stone area. Then you got the bus home and I walked. Within two and a half hours of this phone call to Cheshire Police, officers were at Scarlett and Eddie's homes where they were both arrested on suspicion of murder. While Scarlett was getting arrested, she turns to the police officer and says, Is me being a suspect because I was the last person to see her? How come I'm a suspect? Within 36 hours of Brianna's murder, both suspects were in custody. Their bedrooms were also searched, where in the back of Eddie's wardrobe, his hunting knife was found, which later revealed to have traces of Brianna's blood on it. In Scarlett's room, they uncovered her handwritten plan on how they intended to murder Brianna, all the way down to the date and time. Listen, (laughs) I know that they're children, um, but even at 16, I would like to think that I would have known to possibly be less incriminating. Maybe that's not a fair thing to say because they are children but if you watch a lot of crime content or you watch a lot of horrors you probably know not to have handwritten plans of the date time victim that you're going to be murdering during questioning scarlet continued to wave the narrative of the 17 year old male from manchester being the last person to be seen with brianna eddie on the other hand didn't quite stick to scarlet's plan Eddie claimed that he left Brianna and Scarlett to go to the toilet, and by the time he returned, he saw Scarlett violently stabbing Brianna. In his statement, he revealed that he went over to Brianna to check if she was still breathing, but got blood on his hands and panicked. So in absolute shock, he ran, leaving Brianna behind to bleed out. As the interview goes on, the police are asking more and more questions when both Scarlett and Eddie clock that probably they have more of them than they'd like to believe, so they shift their answers into no comment. Prior to the trial in November 2023, both Scarlett and Eddie were assessed by psychiatrists, where they suspected that Scarlett was experiencing ADHD, anxiety and autism, so pretty much all of the A's on the list, but this was later revoked and Scarlett was actually diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder as opposed to autism. By definition, antisocial personality disorder is a challenging disorder characterised by impulsive, irresponsible or often criminal behaviour, 
Typically, they can be quite manipulative as a character, deceitful or reckless even, and they often don't care for others' feelings in the process. Which, yeah, judging from what we know on Scarlet, I'd probably agree with this. But remember, I'm no psychologist, so I'm not out here trying to diagnose people, but I'd say that's probably about right from what we've seen so far. It's also important to note that it's really hard to diagnose teenagers because their brains haven't finished developing. Um, it doesn't stop finished developing until we're about 23, I think. So it's really hard to get a diagnosis under the age of 18 here in the UK. Eddie, on the other hand, was diagnosed with autism and anxiety. His verbal communication skills had suddenly become extremely limited following his arrest and he actually went into a state of selective mutism. He now would only verbally communicate with his mum. This can be quite typical for children with autism to do in times of high stress. They kind of revert to a childlike state almost. It's like a self-soothing coping mechanism which creates a trauma bomb with the parent. And I think from what we've seen from Eddie, this also matches up. Because throughout his interactions with Scarlett via messages, we have multiple occasions where Eddie is almost detached or doesn't quite grasp the severity of the situation. And it's important to point this out because this, in a combination with antisocial tendencies from Scarlett, kind of like to go hand in hand or a fire fuels fire situation. I'm not trying to say that one party is more guilty than the other in this, but I do think that Scarlett probably enjoyed the fact that Eddie was quite vulnerable and would often agree to what she was saying. Was it this deadly combination between the two that resulted in the brutal murder of Brianna Jai? Would they have individually gone out of their way to murder had the other party not been involved? I don't know, or at least I don't think Eddie would have. As for Scarlett, we can't tell. After all, she did have a fascination with witnessing live pain and torture and she had also tried to do this with Brianna with the pills, allegedly, from what we can tell, by herself already. So perhaps she would have gone on to do this by herself and it just so happened that she had the help from Eddie along the way. But it's also important to note that there's no build-up of characterizations of violence throughout their childhood for either of these two suspects. There's no kind of build up which leads them to this. They just all of a sudden do this. And it's really odd because normally children start showing these behaviours quite young and they'll start harming animals or harming parents or siblings. But there's none of this. On the 27th of November 2023, the trial began in Manchester Crown Court. Throughout court, Eddie was allowed to sit in a completely separate room whilst being questioned. He would write out his responses where an intermediate would then read the answers aloud to the court. This was then live broadcast to the courtroom. This is quite rare for a court to do, to attend to the mental health needs of a suspect in such a way. But the fact that Eddie's autism had developed so rapidly after his arrest shows the state of stress that his brain was probably in and I think in interest of making it through the proceedings in court they had to do this as he probably would have crumbled on the stand and probably would have ended up in a no comment or just not being able to respond at all which yeah and we do have to remember that they are children so their state is also important in this because they have to protect the children involved in this case. Defence for Eddie said that Scarlett had told him to bring his hunting knife to the park and that she had a plan to stab Brianna. Eddie further stated that he did not take Scarlett's alleged plan seriously because she had a history of always talking about murder and nothing happened. Eddie denied holding any animosity towards Brianna regarding her trans identity. Eddie's defence accused Scarlett of manipulating him due to his autism, which we touched upon earlier, but it's important to realise that Eddie didn't need much convincing and he often would suggest to bring a knife himself. Scarlett's defence held up in court that whilst, yes, she may have lured Brianna to the park where she was stabbed that day and she did come up with the plan in question, it was only done as part of a fantasy because, yeah, that makes it okay and that Eddie was the one who actually carried out the stabbing. She described herself as not stopping the act despite her surprise due to being afraid of Eddie, describing him as a sociopath, which... I mean, Scarlett's text kind of disproved this theory a little bit, saying, I want to stab her at least once, because, you know, it's fun, lol, like, I just, yeah. On the 20th of December 2023, the jury deliberated for over four hours, where eventually both were found guilty of Brianna's murder. On the 2nd of February 2024, the day of sentencing, Scarlett admitted that she did stab Brianna, after Eddie initiated the attack, but then couldn't carry on after he got nervous. So she took over and stabbed her, quote, a lot of times. She also revealed it was originally her intention to take a part of Brianna's flesh as a token had she not been caught by Mr and Mrs Vice in the park that day. And perhaps she would have done this. I fully believe that she probably would have taken a token from Brianna's body, which is awful to say. It was on this day, on the 2nd of February 2024, just two months ago from when this episode's being recorded, the judge revealed that the suspect's names were to be revealed to the public. 
Scarlett was sentenced to a minimum of 22 years in prison, where parole will be considered on the 25th of January in 2044, whereas Eddie received a minimum sentence of 20 years in prison, eligible for parole on the 25th of January 2042. Just a quick side note here, if you watched last week's episode I covered on the Stephen Lawrence case, the suspects received less of a sentence than these two, as they were trialled as juveniles due to the fact they were 16 at the time of this crime. And I understand there was more premeditation in the Brianna Jai case, um, but it's interesting, isn't it? I won't go too much into it, but it's interesting that they can sentence children as adults when it suits them, because these two sentencings weren't that far apart in terms of years, one being in 2017, I think it was, to 2024 so yeah just thought i'd say out there that if the boot fits and whilst this is a hefty sentence for scarlet and eddie considering that they are 16 at the time of conviction but they will both be below the age of 40 by the time they are eligible for parole which is still pretty much a whole life ahead of them after the trial detective mike evans said that he thought brianna wasn't killed because she was transgender but that being transgender made her more vulnerable and accessible. I don't know, guys. This is a really, really tricky one to comment on. I don't know if they specifically set out to kill Brianna because she was trans, because there were multiple people on the list that weren't trans or even part of the LGBTQ plus community, but it is a huge factor that plays into it. And we know this because of the language that's used between the two, where Eddie only refers to Brianna as it and the whole, I want to see whether it screams like a man or a girl comment. But the fact that Brianna is trans definitely comes into play here. And of course, Brianna was probably more vulnerable than the other potential victims on their kill list. But I'm in two minds about this one because Eddie was the only one to really make dehumanizing comments about Brianna's gender. Scarlett always referred to Brianna as she. It's, yeah, it's really tricky to comment on. I mean, let me know what you guys think in the comments below. I'm not saying that Brianna's trans identity didn't come into play in this case. Of course it did. Obviously it did. That's undeniable. But I just don't think it was the driving force or the driving motive. Yes, I think it was partially a motive, but I don't think it was the be all and end all. I think a lot of it was just a sadistic nature that they wanted to kill someone. And realistically, Scarlett was close with Brianna and could probably convince Brianna to meet them in the park that day. Since the pair's sentencing on the 7th of March 2024, this month that I'm recording this, Eddie applied for a permission to appeal his conviction, with the result of this still being in the air, though I don't think that's probably going to get any airtime, to be honest. Whereas Scarlett, on the other hand, has expressed that she does have a desire to kill again. There's speculation throughout this case that the kids didn't know that everything was going to be recovered by the police, like I said earlier, with them kind of covering their tracks with one exchange of like three messages, and then later that same day they're like, are you scared about getting caught? Like, they don't try that hard to cover their tracks most of the time. But it does beg the question to me, why did they bother trying to cover up, you know, the whole, oh, did you hear that someone got stabbed? Wow, that's awful, really. And why does Scarlett go through the effort of actually texting Brianna's phone to say, like, why did you ditch us for that 17-year-old boy? Like, she was already sowing the seed of this 17-year-old boy from Manchester before she was even questioned or before she even brought it to police attention or her mum's attention. Also, since Eddie's conviction, his father, Kyle Ratcliffe, has since been revealed as a sex offender and has been jailed for secretly filming young girls getting undressed at a water park and exposing himself to 16-year-old children. I can't even begin to comment on that one. I, yeah, I don't really want to talk about the, the files. I don't really want to comment on that. But yeah, I just thought it was quite interesting that within the space of two months Eddie's mum has lost her son for murder he's now in prison facing murder charges for over 20 years and her husband is now in prison for being the big p word um which I can't bring myself to say online I really really feel for Eddie's mum there that's horrific Esther Jai actually met Scarlett's mum this March in 2024, where Esther commanded the other mother's bravery and said, both of us are mothers trying to navigate something that nobody should ever have gone through. And she's right. All parents involved in this, I can't imagine their horror and disgust to know that your child is capable of doing something like this. Following Brianna's murder, a TikTok memorial account and GoFundMe page was set up by Brianna's friends to support her family, and it raised over £70,000 in just three days and amassed over 36,000 followers on TikTok. Across the UK, silent vigils were held in the spirit and honour of Brianna Jai. And yes, as much as the police handled this case very well, I do have to say, the media 
unsurprisingly let us down. Multiple news outlets misgendered Brianna and even deadnamed her, which is inexcusable in my books. Labour Party MP Dawn Butler said on Twitter, anyone in the media who is using her dead name trying to erase Brianna's identity should be ashamed of themselves. Damn straight, you tell them, Dawn Butler. Former Labour Party leader Jeremy Corbyn also responded by saying she was killed because she wanted to be herself, adding, my thoughts are with Brianna's family and the trans community fighting for safety, dignity and liberation. Twitter campaigns called for UK government to issue a gender recognition certificate to Brianna so that she can have the dignity in death that everyone else in this world takes for granted. A petition circulated reaching more than 13,000 signatures for Brianna's death certificate to posthumously reflect her gender as female, but sadly this petition was rejected by the British government, who stated in response that their current policy strikes the right balance and they have no plans to change it. I don't know the specific laws around genders on death certificates. Um, I'm sure there are laws and rules that are probably hundreds of years old. But what difference does it make to the people ruling this certificate? And I can almost guarantee you that nobody on that panel is trans. Sure, it coincides with what the birth certificate says and contributes to national statistics, but it contributes to these statistics incorrectly. I think it's the very least that could be done to honour Brianna and let her die with the dignity that she would have wanted and that she deserved. Trans lives are very much in danger a lot of the time, which is not okay. Hate crimes and hate attacks shouldn't exist, period. But we do have a long way to go with society's views on trans rights. I guess it's important to take away from this case to reflect on what you need to do to support your local trans community and protect those around you. As always, we are nowhere near where we need to be. Granted, we are a long way in the last 20 years for the trans community, but there's a lot more research that needs to be done and, and there's a lot more that needs to be done to protect people, first and foremost. So there we have it, guys. That was the awful case of Brianna Jai. Heartbreaking doesn't even begin to cover it. I'm sure that Brianna would have grown into a successful, powerful woman and that, sadly, got taken away from her to satisfy the sadistic needs of others. Take some time to pause and do something nice for yourself today. Drink some water. And for those of you that don't believe me when I practice what I preach... Here is my water bottle. Oh yeah, it's a big boy. If you are listening on Spotify, please leave a review. And if you're on YouTube, please subscribe, like, comment below what you thought of today's case and which case you would like me to cover next. As always, thank you so much for the love. I'm really trying to throw myself into YouTube and make more content for you guys and connect on new levels and avenues. So keep an eye out for new content coming soon. And if you want that extra gold star from me, and you want to be in my good books, share my channel with your friends, tag me on social media at charlie.inspired so I can see and share the love and message you thanks and gratitude and stuff. As always, stay safe and I'll catch you next time. Bye.